Welcome to the Passive Mobile Home Park Investing Podcast with your host, Andrew Keel. This is the podcast where you can get the education you need to invest 100% passively in the highly profitable niche of mobile home parks. Welcome to the Passive Mobile Home Park Investing Podcast. This is your host, Andrew Keel. And today we have an amazing guest in Mr. Mark Curry of SMK Capital. Before we dive in, I want to ask you a real quick favor. Would you mind taking an extra 30 seconds and heading over to iTunes to rate this podcast with five stars? This helps us get more listeners, and it means the absolute world to me. So thanks for making my day with that five-star review of the show. All right, let's dive in. Mark is the co-founder of SMK Capital Management. SMK is an investment firm that provides investors with passive income and growth through the creation of partnerships in private commercial real estate opportunities. Mark has invested in real estate for over 15 years and has transacted in over $1 billion, that's right, with a B, worth of real estate during that time, including mobile home parks, self-storage, multifamily, and others. Mark, welcome to the show. Thanks, Andrew. Happy to be here. Awesome. Well, let's let's dive in. Can you start out by telling us your story and how you got into manufactured housing? Sure. Yeah. So um, I started investing in real estate in 2005, pre-recession. You know, everything was hunky dory up and to the right, and can't lose money, right? And um, values will just keep going up. But I was working at the same time uh, as a financial analyst by trade and shifted careers along the way into um, an operations role, a logistics fulfillment and staffing, et cetera, uh, for a distribution company. And those two experiences, Andrew, kind of, I call them corporate experiences, really helped me transition into real estate uh, investing. And so again, I started doing it on the side um, in 2005. And then, you know, equity in that first property I bought, uh, through by 2007, eight, it was worth significantly more. It was in Southern California. So a lot of appreciation in that market. And so I took out a line of credit um, and partnered with my brother. We bought a fourplex in Hollywood, California. That was, uh, geez, we overpaid. We micromanaged all the repairs and everything. Uh, it was 75% vacant when we bought it. And um we overspent, over rehabbed, and it took too long. So I learned a lot by doing, right? But uh, we held it through the recession. We held everything we had at that point through the recession. And uh, just did another, another kind of partnering with family along the way. And then by 2010, you know, the career I was at, uh, it, it just didn't have much of a future. It was heavily impacted, you know, negatively through the downturn. And um, I was really enjoying kind of what I would call the side gig, right? Real estate investing and pulling capital from family. And, and we built a small portfolio. We were buying a lot of distress at the time, Andrew, single family, small multifamily, at auctions, you know, short sales, REOs, foreclosures, you know, all cash. And then you put in twice as much on rehab, you know, just a lot of heavy lifting value add stuff. Um, and by 2000 and nine and 10, I started, you know, we had a little bit of data of through the recession that, that had been going on. And we started looking and I'm uh, asking myself, you know, what else am I missing? What else should we be investing in? What else has done well so far? And there wasn't much, of course, right? The world was falling apart around us, but mobile homes was one of the asset classes that had data and positive trends and talking with operators at the time that, you know, vouched for the, the macro level data inside their own internal portfolios. And, um, and that was just kind of a, now I was, I was going down a rabbit hole, right? Just what else can I learn? How much more? Tell me more. And, and that's kind of how I got in. That's amazing. Was there like one, you know, metric that, that you saw and you were like, this is it. What, what was that like? Defining? Yeah. Net operating income growth and stability through the recession. That, that was it. It still is today. We use that metric regularly. And, you know, Sam Zell's portfolio is, is public information out there. And we've got an article that we wrote up a few years ago about it. But um, there's a chart that he has going back to the 80s, Andrew. I'm sure you've seen it. But it shows uh, equity lifestyle properties, his company, 
um, quarterly net operating income, um, again, for 30 years through the recession compared to, I think it's apartments and office, but don't quote me on what he's comparing to exactly. But you just see this picture and you're like, oh my gosh, this thing is, is so much different, right? It's so resilient and it's, uh, tell me more. <laughs> so that, that was a big one for me. Yeah, no, I think that's huge. You know, one of the things uh, when I was researching for this show, you know, I did some research on the REITs and, you know, the, the ELS and the Sun communities, you know, the, the average tenant stays like, I think it was something like 17 years. And it was just so like, wow, like that one metric can change, you know, that's worth starting a business over like that one metric, you know, so it's just uh, huge how, you know, you saw the opportunity and went for it. So and the, the average home in the park stays even longer. Yeah. I, I think it was like, is it like 30 plus years, Andrew? It's been a while since I've quoted that, that information, but my gosh, like mobile homes are just not mobile and uh, there's plenty of data to prove that. So yeah, very good fundamentals there for sure. Totally. Definitely a moated investment, which is why a lot of investors like it. Maybe you could tell us this, Mark, you know, what are the most important things that passive investors, you know, limited partners need to look out for when investing into mobile home parks? You know, if they're, they're new to the new to the asset class, you know, from your investor lens, because I know, you know, you, you, op, you invest with other operators through your fund, you know, what, what are the most important things if you had to dial it down to like, you know, just a short list? Well, number one, and this is for all asset classes that we invest in is people. It's definitely number one, Andrew, right? And I say this a lot, but you can have the nicest mobile home park in the best part of town. And if you've got the wrong people operating it, managing it, overseeing it, et cetera, you'll lose money. You could run it into the ground pretty quickly. And so that's definitely the first is the operator, um, the people. And if you're going to be passive, then it's, it's definitely even more important. If you're going to be active, I know you didn't ask, but I'm sure there's some folks thinking, hey, I should go out and buy one myself. Then, you know, it's still the people. It's you, right? It's your uh, team or the team that you plan to create and utilize to operate the, the, the park. And so I think that's, that's without a doubt, the most important is the people. Uh, and if you want me to keep going, there's a few other things that we look for. Please. I'll say that uh, you want to look location specific. Are you the most affordable game in town? You know, are stick built homes down the street selling for the same price that are even bigger? You know, then you might want to be cautious, right? Um, and so the, the, the benefit of manufactured housing on a macro level is you're providing an affordable housing solution. That's a big part of our thesis, has been for many years. We're going to continue to provide that investment product for investors and for residents alike, because there's demand from both sides. But if you find a situation where it might be a demographic or a region that, you know, it's just pretty comparable to everything else, you know, then what's the benefit for the resident to live there? You know, that, that might be where you could see a little bit of um, challenge in the business plan there, because there's a lot of competition. And, if you're going to do that, that's okay, but maybe you don't go into manufactured housing. Maybe you buy single families instead, right? And uh, um, the benefit, again, typically that we look for in this space is to be the most affordable housing solution in the area. Yeah, no, that's huge. I think that's uh, when we were talking about a potential recession on on the last uh, interview we did, you know, we were talking about, you know, there's there's downward pressure, right, with people downgrading from from houses they can no longer afford or rents they can no longer afford coming down into mobile home parks. And then, you know, there's pressure uh, because, you know, being the most affordable option, there's nowhere else to go. You know, it's it's you you live in, in a mobile home or you, you end up in your car. So I think that makes it very unique in that that aspect. Mark, let me ask you this. What was your most recent investment and why did you choose it? So it's, it's April of 2021, and, and we, we're, well, let me put a little bit of context here, Andrew. Uh, we did one investment in 2020 on purpose. We watched, we learned, we analyzed our own portfolio, we analyzed macro level data, we analyzed our operating partners' portfolios. This is across multiple asset classes, not just mobile home parks. 
and we learned and we, we, you know, we didn't know what was going to happen, right? Uh, Q1 of 2020 was a shock to everybody um, and nobody knew the outcome. And so we're, we're a year into that now, right? A little bit more than that. And um, we've got plenty of data. We've got a lot of information on trends that we're utilizing to make investment decisions. And so far this year, we've invested in three different investments, um, two mobile home communities, um, we've also invested in ATMs, which are high cash flow investment. And this week, we're going to invest in another mobile home park uh, portfolio. And in two weeks, we're investing in an apartment community. Very cool. Very cool. So you, you mentioned a lot of data, that you looked at a lot of data from 2020 to make these decisions. Maybe you can elaborate a little bit on what data points you are watching and why. Yeah, so the, the big two, again, this is macro across multiple asset classes, um, occupancy and collections, meaning receivables. Are tenants staying and paying? That's the big two. And then from there, we're looking at, of course, net operating income. Are we flat? Are we declining? Are we growing? Are there a lot of concessions being given to maintain occupancy? Um, are, are tenants paying half the rent or are they paying full? And um, those are some of the data trends that we've been watching, of course, for a year plus. Um, and largely, we're, we're pleased to say that the majority of our assets, the tenants have continued to stay and pay. Um, and at the same time, we're seeing you know, even more demand from our exit strategy, which is to sell to another investor or investor group or private equity group, et cetera. There's a lot of capital uh, from the, the buy side looking for you know, high yield, attractive location, um, recession resilient assets. And that's what uh, we've been focusing on for a number of years. So I think we're, we're really well positioned, but uh, the data so far has resulted in us not changing our investment strategy. Um, the only thing we're doing is being a little bit more conservative, Andrew, with some of the assumptions looking forward um, on rent growth, on economic occupancy, and on, you know, if, it's, if there's a lease up strategy, it might take a little longer than pre-COVID. So uh, all in all, we're, we're pleased with, with what the asset classes we invest in, the strategy within those, and we're just being a little more conservative now looking forward. Very cool. Well, I got lots of questions on that. I think, <laughs> sure. I think that was, that opened up Pandora's box. Uh, but so I just, I just finished the book Clockwork and in there he talks about a QBR, the queen bee roll. And uh, so I got this sticky note right here on my, my monitor that if you can see the video, this is like our queen bee roll in our company as, as operators of mobile home parks. And that's occupancy. That's like the most important thing because we know if we got, if we got, you know, we got heads in beds where we're going to collect 95% of them, you know, of the, of the rent. So I think you, you mentioning, you know, what did occupancy look like? I think that's a huge data point that that is most important. And that is really, really valuable to, to, to see. And, you know, we've just seen a lot of demand for our, our mobile homes in our parks, which is, which is awesome. Um, so, yeah, I love all those data points. Um, you mentioned some some items outside of mobile home parks. You know, one of them being ATMs, which is pretty interesting. Maybe you could shed some light on on that. Yeah, um, yeah, it's very niche, very uh, very unique asset class and investment vehicle. But I tell a little backstory first. So, I, um, a close colleague of mine for about 11, 12 years now, full time um, passive income investor. And when I initially met him, he, I think he was invested, Andrew, probably in like 40, 50 different investments at the time. Mm -hmm. And so I asked him, what's the highest cash flowing investment that you've ever been involved in? And he didn't blink an eye. He just said ATMs. Um, and I, I didn't know what he meant, right? I thought that was some acronym for something that I'd never heard of. And sure enough, he meant uh, the cash machines. And that always stuck with me. Um, and I've, we've co-invested many times since then. And then in, in 20, I think 2018, 2019 or something, he comes to me and says, Mark, we've got something here that you're going to want to see. Um, 
as an investment option. And we just went down the ATM rabbit hole. <laughs> I spent about five, six months researching, analyzing, you know, visiting, uh, traveling, et cetera. And I, I don't use ATMs that often, Andrew, my family and I don't. So I was a bit of a skeptic to say the least when I first um, thought about it again in the last few years. But there's plenty of data and analysis that shows, at least in the US, a predominant portion of the population still relies on cash regularly. And so um, anyway, that's that's the, the demand side. And then we've got a partnership with a uh, an operator that just does ATM investments. They're, I think, now the fifth or sixth largest ATM operator in the country. Wow. Um, and some of the, the executive staff there chatted with a bunch of times have been in the industry since you know, you and I were kids. So uh, they know more about ATMs than you and I probably ever want to know. And so we, we partnered with them and it's a high cash flow stream and uh, very unique. Very cool. Very cool. Well, yeah, very, very niche, I would say. Oh, yeah. Uh, definitely an alternative investment, just like, you know, mobile home parks. So uh, very cool. Uh, Mark, have you ever had any deals that went bad? And, you know, you know, when you're raising capital and things like that, and maybe you can explain what happened. So uh, I think maybe I'll share two stories. Um, well, I'll just say this. We've never lost any money, investor money in commercial real estate investing. Um, we're proud of that. We don't want that to change. And, and I think being conservative and work, working with the right people um, will continue to, to be able to achieve that goal. Uh, step one, as Warren Buffett says, don't lose money, right? And step two, don't forget about step one. So mm -hmm. um but with that, I'll say there's two stories that come to mind. Um, so early in our, our years, we, again, I mentioned we flipped a lot of houses, Andrew. We buy a lot of heavy lifting houses, uh, heavy lifting meaning a lot of value add, um, rehab, adding bathrooms, moving walls, gutting kitchen, you know, taking them down to the studs, new electrical, new plumbing, roofing, windows, you name it, right? Um, and there is a, uh, a, a property that... Um, we, we we basically missed our mark on the resale price at the time. And we over uh, spent first our budget on construction costs and it took longer than we expected. So kind of the triple whammy, right? Of the three risks in, um, in, in flipping houses. And so uh, we did fine in a sense where we still sold the house, but it took longer. Our investors, I think we lost, lost probably around 10% of their investment, give or take, Andrew. Um, and so on, on that one, it actually came out of pocket a little bit and, and made up some of that shortfall for our investors. Uh, a lot of them are repeat, you know, personal contacts. And so uh, my brother was one, for example. And so we softened the blow and they understood it's a higher risk, higher potential return investment. Um, but we've also flipped, I think, another 50 houses and all of them produce great returns. Amen. So their, their net was, was great at the end of the day. Uh, but that's what you have to watch out for on, on flips. And we don't do any more of those. We stopped flipping about four years ago. Um, and then there's another house, Andrew, that uh, just a quick story, but it's in, it was in Florida. It was a duplex side by side. Get a call from my property manager one day. Hey, Mark, we've got a, we've had a fire at, at the duplex. Uh, and I said, I started laughing. I thought he was joking, honestly. He said, no, 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 I'm being serious. The, the tenants had to jump out the window to get out. I said, oh my gosh, are you joking? What's going on here? And so essentially what happened was the, the tenant's car, uh, a Ford excursion to be exact, exact um, no offense to Ford excursions, but this particular Ford excursion just spontaneously combusted while parked in the garage and they were just having dinner inside. Jeez. Yeah, and so we had uh, pretty much a total loss the pictures are uh, scariest to say the least. The fire department had to come and drag the vehicle out of the garage, and you know the rubber was gone. I mean, it was just down to the the rims, and uh, it was it was rough. it was rough. And so, total loss. Tenants um, uh, obviously it was no longer inhabitable, but everyone was okay, thankfully. So we ended up um, being properly insured. Number one, which is critical. Number two, we. I, I, we've been through this before with hurricane damage, but we had learned through the hurricane and through this that although we're properly insured, it's, uh, how can I say this? Insurance company may not always have your best interest in mind. Um, and what I mean by that is we ended up hiring a 
uh, assigning a power of attorney over to a, a private claims adjuster who acted on our behalf to really determine the cost of repair to this fire damage duplex. And uh, long story short, he got us a lot more money by arguing with them and providing renderings and drawings and schematics of what it actually needs to entail to rebuild. And we ended up selling it as is after collecting, of course, uh, our reinsurance and proceeds and our investors did much better than initially projected. And so that was a scary story that ended up turning positive. Um, it took six to eight months. Uh, and so that was a a stressful, but also uh, yeah, very geez. much a learning experience time. So yeah, yeah if you're going to yeah. do this, just get ready because something's going to happen at some point and you got to be ready yeah. for it. Yeah, totally. Jeez. Yeah. Glad that nobody got hurt though. Jeez. Uh, Mark, tell me this. What does the perfect mobile home park look like in your eyes and why? Yeah. So I'll, I'll say this. Andrew, the perfect mobile home park doesn't exist probably. <laughs> if it does, let me know. Call me. <laughs> um <laughs> But, uh, you know, we like value add. We want to be able to grow that operating income. And so a big portion of that is um, being able to effectuate NOI growth without relying just on market appreciation. Um, and so I'll say, maybe it's, it's this. Maybe it's 80% it's occupied at acquisition, give or take. Um, it's got uh, well below market rents, call it 30%. Um, it's 100% um, resident owned homes. It is in an urban infill area where there is no competition to potential new supply, which is also very low risk in manufactured housing. Um, and we could come in and, and fill the, the, the vacant lots with new homes and sell them. We can increase existing lot rent as well, and we can uh, continue to operate it. And so that's probably a good foundation for perfect, if you want to call it that. Yeah, no, totally. Tell me this, you know, circling back, you know, when you guys are vetting an operator to invest in, you know, what are some of the, the tips you can give our listeners to, you know, finding the right person, the right operator to work with? Okay, yeah. Um, well, I'll say this, it takes a lot of time for us. We're always vetting our operators new, existing, it's it's a never ending process. And so if you're in the first initial stages of vetting an operator, of course, you're gonna ask a lot of questions, you know, 100 questions, probably. Um, get to know them, their philosophy, their strategy, why do they do what they do? How do they actually execute, you know, using real examples? Um, we tend to focus on operators that have, you know, a lot of experience, Andrew, we're in the final, I'm going to say final, but we're in the, the peak pricing of the current cycle. Um, asset values are higher than they've ever been before across most of our asset classes. Um, supply is, you know, there's not enough compared to the investor demand for those asset classes. And so margins are squeezed. And so that's the current climate with that in mind. It's, you, you tend to have a little bit more risk investing with an operating partner that's somewhat new. They haven't been through market cycles. They haven't uh, experienced a ton of unknowns, right? You don't know what you don't know. And so we try and focus on operating partners that have uh, a long track record. Typically, a lot of them, you know, no less than about 100 million in assets under management. Um, a lot of them, even over 500 million in assets under management. Um, and uh, pedigree that, you know, you can't beat, right? So if you can't beat them, join them. That's kind of how we look at it. Uh, yeah, that's, that's probably a good start, but it's, it's a, for us, like, it's, it's all referrals, Andrew, right? We, we get referred to operators because, hey, Mark, I just invested with so-and-so. I've been investing with these guys for three, four years. You should probably talk to them if you're interested. And we're not on the MLS talking to brokers or Google is searching, you know, for people. It's, it's all word of mouth. So I would start with, who do you know? And that's usually a good filter for people. Um, Cause again, yeah. we're in the people game. Oh, totally. Uh, Mark, what hurdles does the manufactured housing industry face, you know, moving forward? So, um, 
I think a few things come to mind uh, from an investor standpoint and then an industry standpoint. I'll start with investor standpoint. Uh, supply demand disequilibrium. It's been happening for a while. It's been exacerbated since COVID. Um, we, there aren't enough and there's too many people chasing them. So the outcome is harder to find great deals that have uh, very attractive risk reward profiles. And um, at the same time, one of the benefits I see, which I think goes hand in hand, is that I believe that manufactured housing has one of the highest likelihoods of consistent rent growth. And that's important today in our thesis because that helps drive net operating income growth, which is correlated to the value of the asset and the investment. So um, with that, we still believe the fundamentals are very attractive because of the ability to continue to grow rents and because of uh, the overall bigger picture thesis of providing affordable housing solution. And from a, um, a kind of a different lens, you know, there's been a lot of su supply shock for, um, you know, supply of homes. Manufacturers can't build them fast enough. Uh, and so we've got a lot of waiting lists. Again, that's some of that's been exacerbated by COVID. And so we're seeing, starting to see appreciation of the actual homes, which most people think they tend to depreciate in value, um, but they are actually going up in, in value and cost. And so that might make it harder for people to afford them as the cost of the actual home goes up. Um, and so it, that's part of it. Um, and then I also think you know, rent control might become and continue to be a factor that will limit some of the rent growth. Um, for good and for bad, that's a different discussion, of course. But uh, uh, all in all, we, we're still very much um, excited about manufactured housing. It's probably my favorite asset class, Andrew, and has been for many years. And I don't think there's too much that'll derail that. But uh, we'll see. But so far, so good. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. What do you uh, think about like the $15 minimum wage and how that would affect? Uh, mobile home parks? Yeah, I'll just take it from a resident standpoint. Um, I think it will it help because people can afford uh, potentially higher cost homes, um, which is what we're kind of seeing some of the trends today. And so, uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. I think it could help and it could definitely allow folks to um, have a little bit better life, of course, and cost of living um, going up most likely with inflation and with uh, rent growth, which is essentially inflation passed through to residents. Um, having a higher wage, you know, can only help. Very cool. Yeah, uh, Mark, what can you tell us about SMK Capital? You know, what's your guys' value proposition, and and what makes you guys different? Sure. Yeah. I, you know. We look at a lot of deals, Andrew, um, typically 10 to 20 deals a month, investment opportunities in our asset classes. We invest in about four to 10 a year. So what I focus on is really just remaining disciplined, patient, we say no to a lot of investment options out there and there's a ton. And so uh, we filter through them consistently and some of the value we provide our investors is they get access to our relationships with operators that we've built, you know, over the past 10 plus years, they provide us with a lot of private off market deals that you wouldn't know about if you didn't know us or, or you know, that kind of general connection there. Um, investors also benefit, you know, we focus on diversification a lot. We invest in a lot of different asset classes, as I noted, um, our financial acumen, it's, 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 it's pretty easy these days, Andrew, to manipulate a pro forma uh, projections, right? They're all assumptions like, hey, we're going to be able to do X, Y, and Z. And there's so much fluff and noise in the industry today that we sift through. And you just got to be careful uh, where we are. We tend to try and um, really just pick opportunities that we believe wholeheartedly in, say no to a lot of deals. Um, and really with the goal of just providing our investors with really attractive risk adjusted returns. Awesome. Circling back a little bit, you know, what are some of the common incorrect pro forma assumptions that you see when you're looking at, at deals? Sure. Uh, you know, I wouldn't say maybe incorrect is accurate. I would say that um, 
they were overzealous or, or too much cushion, too much fluff built into them. So rent growth is one. Um, what are they anticipating the natural market appreciation of the rental rates to be? How has it been historically? Why do we think it's going to go up the way they think it's going to go up? Um, occupancy and economic occupancy, like we talked about before. Um, you also tend to, to sometimes underestimate expenses. And you got to look at every line item. And if you have the trailing 12, compare how has it been doing and what makes you think you can do it differently. Um, and then, there, you know, there's some financial engineering going on, Andrew, that uh, not a lot of people may pick up on. But if you want to uh, ask a question, if you can't look at the Excel model and find it yourself, a uh, question would be, are cash flow distributions to investors considered return on capital or return of capital? And so I, I've seen a lot of um, operators over raising meaning they're raising more capital than is needed for the investment. Um, pros and cons to that, right? You might, might have a little access in reserves for the unknown, but a lot of times it's also being done to inflate cash flow projections, typically in year one and two, where they're going to actually return that money to you in year one and show you a you know, cash flow dividend, even though the property isn't actually performing in a positive manner or in a high enough manner to produce that cash flow. And so uh, over raising and returning capital to you and calling it return on capital, even though it's technically a return of capital, that's something we, we look very closely that's for. That's huge. That's a, that's a big golden nugget right there because I've seen that as well where I, I invested in an operator and the, you know, I, I didn't look through the paperwork is as much as I should have the PPM docs and things. And uh, yeah, it was, you know, the, the pref payments that were coming, coming back were all return of capital, which was, you know, it's just a different wording of the, the pref, right? So at the end of the day, that, that 8% I'm getting is off of a, a lower and lower balance. So that's a very good point. Thank you for, for bringing that up. Uh, sure. I appreciate that. Uh, Mark, dude, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. If any of our listeners would like to get a hold of you, what is the best way for them to do so? Sure. Uh, you know, our website's great for a start. Um, our company name, again, is SMK Capital Management. Our website is smkcap.com. Got a lot of resources on there. People can sign up and, and uh, join our investor group. And um, they can also email me, um, our, our website, uh, email address, excuse me, is info at smkcap.com and uh, happy to connect and see if we can help folks. Awesome, Mark. One last question. Sure. If you had to tell, you know, a potential mobile home park investor, just one thing that they, that they could take away from this episode and be like, man, that episode was really awesome. You know, what is that one thing that you would want to get through to them uh, before they make their first investment into a, you know, real estate or mobile home park private equity deal? This is probably what I would say is number one, Andrew, is to, for today, most folks who are passive, they look at the projected return, whatever it might be, let's call it 15% average annual return, IRR, and they don't ask too many questions or look at sensitivity around that return. Do all the stars have to align to get there? Or is there a good chance that we can overperform and beat that return? That's the ultimate question you probably want to ask for every investment. And it sometimes takes time to figure out the answers. But uh, that's kind of the goal of underwriting as an LP, as a passive investor, is what is the likelihood of getting that anticipated result? And what is the likelihood of overachieving or what's the likelihood of underachieving of course as well and trying to find uh the best uh, best balance there right you of course want to try and get opportunities where you think it's very likely that you're going to hit the return or overperform yeah that's that's great i mean what has to go right you know for your pro forma to work out uh i love that well mark dude thank you so much this was extremely valuable really appreciate you coming on the show my pleasure andrew thank you it's been fun all right, that's it for today, folks. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Would you like to see Mobile Home Park value add projects in progress? If so, follow us on Instagram at 
passive MHP investing for photos and awesome videos from our recent mobile home park acquisitions. Once again, that's at passive MHP investing on Instagram. See you there.